In this video, we'll review the Evo software integration for the DJI L1. This system complements our professional grade line of TrueView technology by adding an entry level option. A bit of background on the DJI L1. The system is based on the Livox Avia, a company owned by DJI. The system uses an optical flow for improving heading accuracy, and the gimbal mount improves roll holidays commonly found in rigidly mounted systems. The gimbal also assists with improved flight times. The Livox has some inherent issues which should be expected with this grade of LiDAR. An improved IMU does not improve performance of the sensor. If you decide on the Livox Avia scanner, it is our recommendation to select the DJI L1. Some of the advantages of the DJI L1 include the economic price point, giving companies the opportunity to dip into the technology before purchasing a professional grade system. The system is lightweight, which supports longer flight times and reduced power output. The system has a high pulse rate, allowing for a dense point cloud and a narrow field of view. Some things to be aware of before purchasing, the system does have a limited field of view at 70.4 degrees. This increases the amount of flight lines needed to collect data on sides. We often find air points or pulse discrimination errors, making for a tedious and manual cleanup process. How can our Evo integration complement your L1 workflow? Quite simply, Evo picks up where Terra leaves off. After processing trajectories in Terra, import your data into Evo. Evo allows you to quickly upgrade your LAS data from 1.2 to 1.4. Manage coordinate systems or reproject into a different coordinate system. You can separate LAS files by flight lines. With our module, Strip Align for Evo, or SAFE, you can apply geometric correction, a really valuable tool for improving the quality of the L1 data. Utilize tools for data smoothing, reducing the vertical noise typical of the Avia scanner. Of top importance, add ground control points for data QC. In addition to these DJI L1 specific tools, a license of Evo also provides a wide range of downstream processing tools from our LP360 software package. These include ground classification, volumetrics, feature analysis using point cloud navigation and image explorer, and the ability to manage your photogrammetry processing. Now we'll take a look at the DJI L1 processing in Evo. So we are going to process through an L1 data set in TrueView Evo. What you're seeing here is the interface for TrueView Evo, and we'll start to look at some of the different components as we go through different steps in the workflow. To set this up, of course, you'll have gone out and collected your data in the field. You still need DJI Terra to do the positioning and generate your LAS point files. So you'll have two output folders that we're going to import into our Evo project. You'll have your mission folder, which typically has a naming scheme, something like this, and you'll have your output from DJI Terra. The folder names may change a little bit, but generally you'll have a LIDARS folder, which includes your LAS data and additional outputs from DJI Terra. And this is essentially what you need to create your project in Evo. So with all of our Evo workflows, we start from an import wizard that allows us to import a cycle. A cycle is the term we use within the Evo ecosystem for a flight or a mission, a, a lift. Now, of course, you may be importing a cycle from one of our own TrueView sensors, uh, a 515 or a 650, in which case you're going to be using the top portion here of the import. But the DJI L1 is a guest sensor. Along with the L1, we support the DJI P1, the Phantom 4 RTK, and even the older M210 RTK as guest sensors within our Evo workflows. So we're working with the guest sensor here. We're going to use the guest sensor import routine. So I'll just select DJI L1. And now I need to point to that data, that raw data that I downloaded off the SD card, those folders that I just showed you. So I need the flight folder. So here's my mission folder. I'll go select that. Now, DJI Terra doesn't enforce any particular folder structure on it on you, so we have made the import uh, flexible enough that if you're storing data, uh, your output from Terra in different folders, we're flexible here. But if you do have the same folder structure typically coming out of Terra, you simply have to point to that LIDARS folder that I mentioned. 
This is my output from DJI Terra, my LIDARs folder. And you can see that Evo picks up all of the other subfolders and files that it's going to need for doing the processing. So I can see where my labs data is. I can see the output reports that DJI Terra processed. And then I have some additional data about the flight lines in my project, when the flight started, when it ended, total number of images, and, and so forth. There is an option here that I'm going to turn on to add the Terra, DJI Terra LAS output to my map, into my project. Generally, I might not do this, but I want to show you some of the differences um, with the LAS data as we go through the Evo workflow. So I will add that uh, into, my, into my project. Typically, by default, it's off. I do need to decide where I'm going to store my project. I can have a master project folder here as I have, and I'm just going to call this DJI L1 demo. Cycle, again, cycle is a term we use within our Evo. It means a flight or lift, and you can see it's time tagged here with the date and time, so I can keep my different cycles separate. Now, I do need to know the coordinate system, the uh, spatial reference system for my uh, flight. Typically, of course, you will know that uh, from your, your field crew or from your flight planning or from your surveyor. Uh, good best practice, of course, is always to include that information in a text file uh, with your source data. So we can see here that this is in uh, NAD 83, Alabama West, ellipsoid meters, and this flight was flown at 50 meters AGL. So I can go ahead, I actually use that system quite a lot, so I already have that in one of my default systems. So I can go ahead and select that here, and I'm going to go ahead and finish. This will start the import process for TrueView Evo. So we'll see some status messages going across the bottom bar there where you can see the green progress bar going across. What's happening is that Evo is importing uh, the raw data from the L1 flight. Uh, so that includes uh, all of the information coming out of DJI uh, Terra. It's setting up layers in our map. So Evo is uh, layer based, uh, very much like a GIS or, or you know, normal mapping software. We're going to see some layers get created with different data types on them. It'll also create a backdrop, just a standard Google uh, backdrop for us that we can use just for, for reference. And it does some additional setup and, and um, uh, cleaning up of the data as we, as we import it here. This is a relatively small project, but most projects should import fairly quickly um, uh, once, you've got them, once you've got them set up. So you can see there it's starting to display some things in the map view and cleaning up the end of our end of our import. So now we have our data imported into TrueView Evo. What we're looking at here, of course, this is our map view. So this is a top-down 2D planimetric view of the data. Uh, I've got a Google uh, uh, a Google layer in the background just for reference. I could bring in other reference layers, um, Bing, Arial, that kind of thing. Or if I had ortho photos, I can bring those in as well. What it's displaying here is my labs data as points color coded by elevation then i can see my flight lines my trajectories where my where my uh, or i actually flew the system and then uh, the trajectory points that define define that evo is based on our core uh, lidar point cloud um, software our lp360 engine so we have a lot of tools for helping you visualize and display data in different ways and i'll use different ones as we go through the workflow here um, most of those are contained in some of the buttons up here uh, as with a lot of engineering software lots of options lots of different buttons um, but i'll keep us focused on what we what we need to do to to work through the L1 workflow. So first thing I'm going to do is actually just turn this. I prefer to have a surface view rather than a point view. So I'm just going to look at a tin surface of my data. Over here on the left, this is my table of contents. I mentioned the import wizard creating layers in my map. So it's very GIS-like. You can see I have different layers in here with, for instance, my LAS data, uh, my different trajectory lines, my photo centers. So I can turn these on and off in the display, just as, as you would expect.
once we've got the data into our project, there's a couple of steps we want to go through in Evo to essentially clean up and optimize our point cloud data to basically update the LAS files to uh, a newer version. Uh, DJI Terra exports LAS as version 1.2. We want to update that to 1.4. We also want, and this is very important, to properly assign flight line numbers to our flight strips so that we can do some uh, geometric uh, correction, some strip matching of the data if we if we need to. Um, if you're not familiar with LIDAR, if you're new to LIDAR, the flight line numbering just essentially tells me which flight line, which pass over my project site, uh, my particular points uh, belong to. And I can actually see that in the map view. I can change my color coding to uh, show by what's called point source ID basically means flight line number. And we can see here with the DJI Terra output, we don't have any of that information recorded. And so we can't really do anything uh, to, to match these strips because we don't know which points come from which strip. So we want to update and correct that. We want to update the LAS version um, so that it's the current correct version of LAS, LAS version 1.4. So that's the steps that we're going to go through now to get our, our point cloud data into the state where we can do some additional value add and, and generate some, some deliverables. So I'm going to pull a toolbar button off here. There's a lot of toolbars, as there are in most mapping software. We'll focus on this one, which is the primary set of tools for working with uh, TrueView cycles. Again, it would be the same workflow, the same tools if you're using one of our TrueView sensors. So this is why we talk about the L1 being a guest sensor. It's embedded directly into the normal workflow you would use for any of our TrueView sensors. So if you are a TrueView owner, it's a very identical workflows. That similarity makes the uh, makes you more efficient, of course, in, in handling your different projects. So we have a couple of steps that we need to do. The first one I'm going to do here, I want to go ahead and create some flight lines. So I have a trajectory here, which is a, basically a continuous trajectory of my flight. I don't need data in all of these areas. For instance, out here, I've got some calibration curves. I've got some transit lines. I don't necessarily want to generate data there. So I'm going to go ahead and just auto compute some flight lines. So this will basically look at the uh, trajectory points and determine based on the parameters I've got there where it thinks there were you know flight lines that would be useful for my data. So you can see it's calculated trajectory lines here in certainly the main areas, my main three passes, north-south passes over my project site. It has got this transit line in here, but it's it's ignored the uh, turns or the transits at the end of each line and it's ignored the these areas, which is what I want. I don't need to calculate data in this this area. Now I don't want this transit line either. These flight lines are created as features. They're essentially a shape file. So they're features, they're vectors uh, on a layer in my map. We have a full set of feature editing tools that again are part of that core LP360 engine, but you certainly have access to all of that capability within Evo. So I do have a set of editing tools here and all I'm going to do just to clean up what I want here is just quickly select that extra line that I don't want, delete it, and go ahead just make those save those changes. We also have manual tools that help you um, edit your flight lines, obviously uh, straight north-south lines or east-west lines or you know very linear projects are, work very well for these kind of um, automated flight line tools, but you may have more complex geometry in your flight patterns, especially if you start getting into curved flight lines and so forth. We do have tools that let you work uh, to create those flight lines manually when the automated routines don't get you quite where you need to need to be. So now that I have my flight lines, now that I know where I want to go uh, update and correct my data, I want to go ahead and create a trajectory for each of those areas. The trajectory dialog here is actually quite Im important uh, within the whole uh, TrueView workflow, but also for, for, for L1. It gives me a little bit of information. You know, I can see where my uh, trajectory file is, the output that came out of DJI Terra. I can see information about the serial number of my system. Uh, we have a, a default calibration file in here for um, for the L1. It also lets me determine what I want to do with my photos because I've been talking about the point cloud and LiDAR data, but we do have 
imagery, right? We have uh, uh, imagery that was collected during the flight, and we'll look at how we can use that with uh, MetaShape for Evo to generate the ortho photo. So I may want to set that up in advance, basically tell it where I want to keep my photos. Similar to with the LiDAR data, you know, I don't really need my, my imagery from out on my transit line or my, uh, my calibration loops and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to tell it, just keep the photos that are within my flight lines. That's, that's the area of the project that I'm interested in. And finally, I can tell it to go ahead and update the uh, EXIF tags with what we call true pose information. So that's the updated geocoding, uh, position and orientation of the image uh, at, at the photo center. And this of course really helps with our downstream photogrammetric workflows. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and kick that off and create these trajectories. So there we go, that was relatively quick to process. Um, just get a little status information and notification it did create that retained photo layer for us. So it has modified the data here. Visually, we can't see any changes, of course, but now I want to go ahead and I want to update my LAS data. Uh, so I mentioned there are various aspects of the LAS point cloud coming out of DJI Terra. We want to update that. I mentioned the assigning the flight line numbering as, as critical as well. So we move on to the next step in our TrueView workflow. So again, I'm just looking at this toolbar here and basically going from left to right through the steps. So I want to go ahead and geocode the LIDAR. So we refer to the step as geocoding. For an L1 workflow, of course, the positioning has already been done by DJI Terra. What we're doing here is basically doing the update I mentioned. For instance, here we're promoting up to version 1.4, cleaning up the LAS file a little bit. We can also use this to clip uh, should we want to clip our data either by uh, uh, angle, you know, if we're only interested, say, in um, plus or minus 10 degrees on Nader or something like that, we can do that, or by a, a range, uh, which can be useful in certain use cases and certain scenarios. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, run this step. And this one also runs fairly quickly. You can see a status bar at the bottom where it's going through and updating the flight lines and basically creating a new set of LAS files. So we don't overwrite the original LAS files from TGI Terra. We keep those, that's your source data. We don't want to um, change that in any way. So you do always have the capability to go back to your source data should you need to. So it's actually creating a new set of LAS files, adding those into the map as a new layer and that's what we're going to work with. So we can see here it's created this new LAS layer. When I have multiple layers in my project that have LiDAR data, that have LAS, LAS data on them, I can display multiple layers at once, or I, I often will want to just limit myself to a single LAS layer. So we have the concept of the active LAS layer. So which which of your LiDAR layers in your map are you working with? And I can always set that up here. You see I've got my original Terra LAS layer, and now I've got the new LAS layer that we just created. And again, I'll change the um, display here a little bit just to make it a little bit more uh, easy to see what I'm talking about. I'm going to go back to a surface uh, tin model here. So I have a surface display. I can turn on, for instance, intensity shading so that I can get a little bit of context uh, um, about what I'm looking at. And just for clarity, I'm going to turn off our different flight line and trajectory information here. I'll even turn off our retained photo layers. We just want to look at the uh, the LiDAR data for now. So if I switch my view over to uh, source ID, which again is flight line numbering. So now you can see I have my points assigned to my individual flight line. So uh, blue, green, and red, of course, there's a lot of overlap in this project, which is uh, good. We often want to have overlap in, in areas where we're trying to either increase density or we, where we want to do strip matching, which is what, what I'm going to. Um, but this has updated that file coming out of DJI Terra. So now I've got a more um, a comprehensive tag set of data that I can do some additional things with uh, the, to, to improve the quality of my data. Now, 
there are other ways to look at the data in Evo, and I'll just bring up a couple of other views just to familiarize with them and to show you some of the aspects of the data that I want to look at. Of course, we can always bring up a what we call a planimetric or isometric view. Here, this is being viewed unlike in the map view where it's by elevation, this is actually by class at the moment. I can switch back to elevation. Now we've got something that looks a little bit more like the point clouds we're used to looking at. We can sort of see we've got some fields off to the west side of our project. This is actually a rail, uh, rail line, rail track here, and then uh, also with a road running along beside it. And of course, we've got some trees and so forth. So we have these kind of views, very helpful for when you're looking at the data, um, trying to assess or analyze the data in, in different ways. We also have the standard profile view, and that's what I want to look at here. So here I'm just drawing a profile across the rail track and across the, uh, the road there. And again, if you've worked with LiDAR data, you're quite familiar with these profiles. If you're not, this is just a vertical slice through the data. I can see actually here's my rail lines here. And I have road surface over here. I do have, you know, I'm picking up the vegetation, but similar to what you would expect with the L1 data, I do get some fuzziness as I start to move into the vegetation, and you can see that um, here. Now, this data in the profile view is colored by flight line as well. It doesn't, um, it can be a little bit difficult in profile to see, but you will actually see, you know, I've got my green line, my red line. This is the overlap area here, and it's quite a fuzzy, quite noisy sort of data. We can uh, visually give you a guide. We can do a quick profile or drop a profile line in here, and you can see when I move away from the area where I've got some overhead, now I can get a bit of visual sense of where these two lines are, right? Uh, so this can be useful. It can let me see, for instance, if I zoom in on the road here, one, the data is quite noisy. If you look at the graticule here, um, it's on the order of 10 centimeters. So, you know, I've got 10 to 15 centimeters easily of point to point noise, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and I can also see that there is a shift here. My my red flight line is lying on average higher than my green flight line in this flat area. And really, this is where strip matching comes in. This is where I can use strip align, strip align for Evo, to apply some strip matching. And, and if I had multiple flights, some, some block flight adjustment to tie my, my flight lines together. This is a standard technique that's used in, uh, in LiDAR, in airborne LiDAR, mobile LiDAR. And we can certainly apply it here. The reason to do this, of course, is I do want to have these uh, different flight lines matching as close as possible. I also want to reduce some of the noise. And that's the step I'll do next after the strip align. Then once I've got my data nicely aligned, once I've denoised it or smoothed the data, then I can move on to looking at different output products or doing different kind of classification steps. But these are two key areas where we add value to your, your L1 data by giving you the capability to apply some of these uh, tools to improve the quality of the data before you even start to generate some deliverables. So I mentioned strip matching and strip align, strip align for Evo. So I'm going to show you this, and this is actually a um, uh, relatively simple step in the workflow, although it does a fairly powerful thing in doing our, our strip matching. So strip align is a program from uh, Bayes Mapping. We've worked with them very closely to integrate it directly into uh, Evo. Uh, we really like the results you get from strip align. It's a very powerful tool. Um, one of the nice things about it is it does not require a lot of, in fact, hardly any user input. So there's not a lot of parameters to tweak or optimization, things that you need to optimize when trying to do your, your strip alignment. So what I'm going to do here, I have another toolbar. I'm just going to pull off so we can see it here. This is our secondary TrueView toolbar or our TrueView Utilities toolbar. And this is where we can find things like Strip Align for Evo, Metashape for Evo, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later, and some other utilities and, and so forth that are useful in, in TrueView workflows. 
So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run strip align for Evo. As I said, there's not really much as the user that I need to worry about here. We've, we've optimized strip align for working with the different sensors in the TrueView workflow. It understands the L1 is a guest sensor. It knows how to configure that to do the strip matching that it needs to do. Essentially, all I need to do is tell it what LiDAR layer, what LAS layer in my map to feed in. And I can feed in multiple layers. So I can do um, you know, multiple day adjustments and these kind of things. I can also set a layer as, as a fixed layer. So essentially I can adjust data down to a known good uh, surface if I have that. And I just need to give it then an output name because it is going to create a new folder, uh, sorry, a new layer in my map. I'll just call it LAS S8 for strip align. And I'm going to go ahead and submit this strip align job. So it's going to go ahead and kick this off. I do get an email notification. Uh, Evo uh, has an email uh, system built into it where if you set up your, uh, your email server information, you can have it uh, fire off notification messages, for instance, when it's starting and stopping jobs and so forth. So that's all it's telling me here. It will have notified myself or whoever uh, is on that distribution list that this job has been started. So this task uh, takes uh, a couple of minutes to run, so we're just going to let that run, and uh, then we'll come back when it's finished. Okay, so I received notification. That took about two and a half minutes, two minutes, 40 seconds to, to run. I got a notification email that was finished. I can always check our job manager to check the status of all of my different uh, jobs in here, and I can see that this one has completed. I do have a post-processing step that I just want to go run, which will quickly add that layer into my project. Again, similar to with the geocoding where we created a new LAS layer, we didn't want to overwrite the original source data. We do the same with strip align. Whenever you run strip align for Evo, we will create a new LAS layer. So you always have the original data, the unaligned data to go back to if you want to. Now, of course, at some point, if you're happy with the results, you can go ahead and delete those layers that are just intermediate layers. That's fine. You don't need those, uh, and you'll still be able to keep your, your original source data. So I've got a third LAS layer in here now, and again, I'll just change um, back to my surface view here and if we look at our original data here so this is the one where I'm displaying by flight line ID um, you can see that I can toggle back and forth between my different LAS layers up here in my active my active box Okay, and so that's how I can choose and select between the different uh, the different layers that I have in my uh, in my project. Now there is an additional step that I want to do. I mentioned we'll look at the results, but I mentioned strip align. That's doing our strip adjustment for us, and then we also want to denoise or smooth the data because even though I have done my strip alignment, if I look at my uh, let's zoom in here and we'll look at a uh, profile in here. I just drop a quick profile across here. So again, this is a, a, a just a slice through my data in this overlap area. And I'm going to use live view. That's just a, a filter view that I can use to change the display of different properties of my point cloud uh, data. So for instance, classification and, and so forth. But all I really want to do actually here is just um, thicken up these points a little bit so they'll display a little bit better for you uh, when I talk about them. Okay, there we go. Just shows up a little bit, little bit better. So you can see here, um, you know, so our, our fly lines do match a little bit better now if we look at our trend lines and our, our, our cross sections there. We don't have that 
fairly visible bias we had in the red line. So we have fitted the lines uh, closer together, but they're still noisy. And again, uh, the graticule, the grid there is on the order of 10 centimeters. So you're looking at 10 to 15, maybe even 20 centimeters peak to peak. Um, you know, we want to we want to smooth that data. We want to denoise that that data uh, so that we have uh, smoother flat surfaces to 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 work with when we're doing any of our our product generation or any of our our point classification. So that's the next step that I'm going to do. And again, this is a value add, and this is something that's going to take that original data. I've updated the the labs files. I've um, modernize the, the header so it's the latest LAS version, added the flight strip numbering, I've done some strip alignment, strip matching, so I've got a tighter fit on my data. The next step is to go ahead and smooth or denoise that data. So within TrueView Evo, we have a series of tasks, we call them point cloud tasks or PCTs, which are essentially scripts or macros that you can run on your data. They're essentially algorithms that do something to your point cloud data. And many of these have been built on, you know, the 20 years that we've been building the software in the Core LP360 engine and have been used uh, for LiDAR data production, both for airborne and helicopter fixed wing and, and so forth. So there's, there's a wealth of existing point cloud tasks, existing algorithms that you can call on in Evo to work with your L1 data. Now, you can create your own library of tasks. We don't have time in today's presentation to go through that, but we do cover that in our, our training. We do uh, spend a fair bit of time in training, helping people understand how to customize and build their own point cloud task library, because everybody will have their own specific ways that they want to process the data. We don't have a single cookie cutter recipe that says you must do it this way. Um, so I've switched here on the left hand panel to my point cloud task view and if i look at the little drop down here you'll see there's a lot of um, tasks these are specifically true view tasks i of course have a larger library of these for doing other things but i've just filtered this just to my my true view and i do have one here called uh smoothing so i'm going to select that this is actually a fairly simple task to set up because similar to strip align, it doesn't require a lot of input from the user to set it up and configure it. I simply need to establish, you know, the input layers that I'm going to feed into this. I can do some filtering. You know, I can smooth just certain classes of points or points in a certain range of a, a scan angle. I mean, this, you can get quite sophisticated about what you want to do, but generally for an L1 workflow at this point, we're just going to smooth everything so I don't need to filter anything. Again, we're going to create a new output LAS file. So I just want to make sure that I've got a new uh, proper path set up and that looks fine for me. And I'm going to create this LAS file, which I'll just call smooth for want of a better term. I'm going to ask it to tile the files. That's just uh, very good for performance, uh, display performance and so forth. It's nice to have a, a nice uh, compact set of tiled files. I could generate as just a single file if I wanted to, uh, but we'll stick with uh, uh, tiles. And I'm going to output all of my points. Again, I could just smooth a certain class if, if I wanted to. So this step is all set up. And this is how you would set up any point cloud task. Uh, regardless of what you were doing. Typically, there'll be uh, several import parameters that you need to set. There may be more user adjustable parameters, uh, for instance, if you're doing a ground classification, um, and then there may be some output uh, pointers that you need to set up. But basically, once you have your point cloud task set up like this, we have a point cloud task toolbar up here. Yes, yet another toolbar, which offers you uh, several different ways to run this. I'm going to go ahead and just run this against my entire data set because I obviously want to denoise the whole data set. So I'm going to kick this off and this will take uh, some time to run and then we'll, we'll uh, come back once that's finished. So there we go. That task does take a little bit to process. It's fairly compute intensive. Uh, took about 11, almost 12 minutes on my somewhat older laptop here, um, but we're completed. We finished that smoothing process. So if I go back to my table of contents in my map, I can see I, once again, I've added another LAS layer. And again, for space purposes, you know, some of these layers are intermediary. I can delete them once I'm happy with the output results. Uh, we simply don't replace the layers we're working from as our source input so that you, uh, you don't lose that source data. 
So I'm going to rename this layer. That's relatively easy to do. I can just click on the layer name here and give it a new name. And this is strip aligned and smoothed. And to compare these, if I switch again to my surface view, make sure I'm on my active LAS layer, switch to my surface view. You can see that I've, I've it just visually, it does look smoother. Um, if I go back to my original data, switch this back over so we have the same colorization we'll just use elevation that's a that's the easiest you can definitely see this texture there because of that noise that 10 to 15 centimeters of uh, uh, peak to peak shot noise we were saying um, once I've gone through my strip alignment uh, and my smoothing I do have a much nicer surface I can see that as well in my uh, profile or my cross cross section here just on this road surface so here is my smoothed data and if you look at this you're probably looking at maybe five to seven centimeters peak to peak of course it's peak to peak that we're seeing when we're looking at this cross section uh, you'll also notice that my uh, flight lines again because we ran strip alignment are fitting quite nicely there the smoothing does help with that a little bit uh, as well of course and again just for comparison if i go back and compare it to my original data you can see we were much noisier and we had that clear bias where my red flight line was clearly higher than my my green flight line so we've done two good value add, add steps here within TrueView evo to improve the quality of the l1 data uh, three actually if we include just updating the LAS file and, and file header information and so forth um, but obviously the strip align and the denoising or the smoothing um, are great ways to improve the quality that we're getting out of the data that we're getting out of the uh, L1 so the next step that we can do here in the workflow I'm just going to zoom uh, out to show the whole of my uh, project layer now I do have the Google backdrop, but of course we can also generate an ortho photo. We collected imagery with the L1, similar to our TrueView sensors, collecting LiDAR and imagery at the same time. We just believe that's just the standard, the way that you should do it. So I do have the ability to generate an ortho photo from my imagery. We've worked with Agasoft to provide an integration for Metashape their structure for motion photogrammetric package uh, directly within Evo. So we call it Metashape for Evo. But the same integration will work if you already have an existing Metashape license, you can use that. You do not need Metashape for, for Evo. But I'm going to show you how you would set up and run uh, an ortho photo generation from your L1 imagery using Metashape for Evo. Now, if you're not a Metashape user at all, perhaps you're using Pix4D, another very good photogrammetric package out there, or there are several others out there as well, of course. We do support the ability to create what we call a photo package. So you can basically export your imagery, your correctly uh, geotagged and updated uh, imagery in a format that can then be ingested by PIX4D, so it has the proper camera calibration information and so forth. It's all structured so you can just run directly into a PIX4D project. But with Metashape, we have a tighter integration. You can actually launch and drive directly from within Evo. So again, on my Truvia Utility Toolbar, this is where I launch StripAlign for Evo. I can go ahead and launch Metashape for Evo. A little bit more setup information is requested than with strip align i mentioned when i was doing the uh geocode step uh, when we were importing and setting up the project one of the things we can do is limit the photo centers that we want to use so we essentially basically told it create a layer with just the retained photos the you know the the imagery from the area of the project that i'm i'm actually interested in and that's what we're going to do you can see here there's not much difference in this project i'm only basically eliminating six six images but if you have large transit legs or for various other reasons you might just want to limit the um the area that you're actually going to generate the ortho 
There's some good quality of life improvements when you run through MetaShape for, for EO things that just make it a little bit easier for, uh, for you to set up or can help you uh, correct in certain use cases or scenarios. For instance, um, if the block bundle adjustment in MetaShape fails in a straight MetaShape project, then you'll simply end up with a gap or void in your data, uh, even if there's imagery there. Uh, by working through MetaShape for Evo, we uh, can override that and tell it to basically go apply the EO from the position solution that we generated for, for the sensor um, uh, and, and hopefully fill in, if you do have some, some quality uh, imagery in that area, fill in that, that gap. The other thing that we can do, because we have LiDAR and imagery, so if you're just using a photogrammetric system, if you're just doing a photogrammetric project, you would use Metashape or Pix4D or another photogrammetry package to generate both your orthophoto and your point cloud. That structure from motion, that's, that's part of the value you can get from that, that approach, and you don't need a LiDAR. But if you do have a LiDAR for all of the advantages LiDAR can give you, for instance, in Canopy and other areas, then you are going to have a LiDAR surface, essentially. We are going to have good elevation data from our LiDAR subsystem, and we can pass that in to Metashape in order to use that as our rectification surface. So we can essentially put in a DEM from our high accuracy LiDAR data and ju just use that to generate an ortho photo. That saves you the processing time of having to do the, you know, generate the point cloud from, uh, from the imagery and also can help you, um, if you clean up that DEM, you can get a, a better surface to rectify too. Um, I don't have a DEM layer set up at the moment, so I'm not going to pass one in here. I could use this to generate the photogrammetric point cloud, but again, generally with a 3D imaging system, which the L1 is, it has both LiDAR and camera, you're generally probably not going to want the, the, the photogrammetric point cloud. Your LiDAR data should be in most cases of higher quality in most areas of your project. So I can go ahead and create a, um, a, a layer name here, and I'm just going to give it This is an ortho from MFE, and we'll go ahead and submit that job. Now, this would use the same job processing as uh, StripAlign did, uh, and we could check on the job status through the email statusing or the job manager there. I'm not actually going to kick this off just for so time purposes because the MetaShape processing, photographic processing does take some time. What I will do is just go import that existing um, previously generated ortho photo from this, this data set. But notice I can add other uh, data to my map. I can add other data into my L1 project in Evo. That can be additional LAS data from other sources. I can uh, pass in rasters, orthos, and so forth. I can pass in feature files and, and so on. So there's a lot of capability, again, because Evo is built on top of our LP360 engine that you get just out of the box to deal with these kind of uh, LiDAR imagery uh, projects. But we're just going to go ahead and uh, let me orthos in here. So I'll go ahead and add that into the, the map. So now I've got a raster layer here. And just to turn off my Google backdrop. So now I've got my ortho that was generated uh, from my L1 flight as well. And this was generated in, in Metashape. Um, I think the pixel size on this ended up being about three centimeters. So quite good quality ortho. Um, it's a 20 megapixel with the 20 megapixel camera with the with the L1. So at this point, we have both our um, our point cloud, which we have value added by uh, updating the LAS, as I've mentioned doing strip matching to give us a tighter fit on the data and denoising that data. So we're looking at data on our, our road surface here, our road over here, we've got nice tight data. We've got good strip to strip fit, we've denoised it. At this point, I can flow into any one of several downstream workflows for generating deliverables. We're not gonna cover those in today's session, but you can imagine these are the standard things that you would do with a uh, drone LiDAR project uh, doing a ground classification. We have point cloud tasks 
um, in here for doing automated ground classification. So I can run essentially an adaptive tin algorithm to, to do ground versus non-ground classifications. Uh, we can thin the data. You know, one of the challenges with the point clouds you get from drone LIDAR, it's very dense data, which is great. It's great for resolution and, um, you know, the type of product we're doing. But often the end user, uh, the customer for that data, uh, their workflows, their software tools don't work with such high density data, especially if, say, they're pulling into a CAD environment or something like that. So you may want to take this really nice, uh, dense point cloud. If I switch this back to my point view. Right, this is all point data in here, and you may want to thin that or grid that to, you know, may somebody may want a, a five foot posting dam or something like that. So we have tools um, that allow you to smooth and thin the data um, within our point cloud tasks. You also have the capability to reproject your data. We do have a full uh, coordinate system uh, engine within Evo that allows you to uh, reproject data both horizontal and uh, vertical to any number of supported systems uh, these are kept quite current uh, because of course it's the same engine that's being used in a lot of our traditional airborne lidar work uh, so we support uh, all the state plane systems utm zones lots of uh, national grids that are in here that have been added over the years and then the various different uh, orthometric models um, uh, different geoid models that are in here um, should you want to be uh, converting from your ellipsoid heights. And that's quite a nice uh, quality of life improvement. It means you don't have to worry about using third-party packages for doing any of that, that reprojection. So with that, just to wrap up, this is essentially the workflow that you would use post DJI Terra for your L1 data. Uh, to improve the quality of the data, the fit of the data, to denoise the data uh, and, and smooth it, and then flow into a downstream set of tasks to generate a deliverable. Maybe that's a contour map, maybe that's a digital train model, uh, or maybe that is a thinned point cloud to deliver to your customer. After this L1 workflow, you can use LP360 to further process your data and produce deliverables. These include ground classification, Volumetrics, Feature Analysis using Point Cloud Navigation and Image Explorer, and the ability to manage your photogrammetry processing. Thank you for watching today's presentation. If you would like some additional information about TrueView Evo and our workflow for L1 processing or any of our TrueView product line, please contact us at info at and we'll be happy to get back in touch with you.